Good evening, and welcome to the 84th annual Supreme Court celebration. Before we begin, I want to especially welcome our guests, Chief Justice Susan Christensen and the members of the Iowa Supreme Court, who will be individually introduced by Chief Justice Christensen. I also want to especially welcome and thank Jim Overdorf, Senior Vice President of the Buffalo Bills, who will be providing our keynote remarks later in the program. We certainly miss the pomp and circumstance and definitely the food uh, that we have our, at our typical Supreme Court Day banquet. And I know we'll all look forward to returning to that in-person event next year. However, the virtual firm, format we're using this year allows us to reach a broader group of participants. And certainly it does not diminish our desire to recognize our wonderful Iowa Supreme Court and our longstanding relationship with them and to honor the well-deserving recipients of tonight's awards. Lawyers and academics and the public know that the Iowa Supreme Court has garnered national respect for leading the country on so many legal issues. What most people don't know, however, are the many ways that they help nurture and educate the next generation of Iowa lawyers through their relationship with our law schools. This week, for example, the court met in small groups with our 1L students, as they do every year, to help them understand how the court operates and decides cases. Certainly, this is not an opportunity that every first-year student has across the country. So let me begin by thanking Chief Justice Christensen and the court for all you do for the state of Iowa and for Drake Law School. And I just want to call out in particular Justice Ed Mansfield, who has now taught at Drake uh, in his spare time, so to speak, for many, many years and exceedingly well. We actually have a rule that our required classes have to be taught only by full-time faculty but we make an exception for Justice Mansfield because we truly consider him to be part of our faculty as well. We begin the program with the results of the Supreme Court competition. This is a truly venerable tradition dating back to the first oral argument competition that we held in 1939. Here to present the results of the final round is the Chief Justice of the Iowa Supreme Court, the Honorable Susan Christensen. Thank you, Dean Anderson. On behalf of my colleagues at the Iowa Supreme Court, I want you to know how much we value our relationship with Drake's um, faculty and staff at the law school, as well as the students. And we appreciate our involvement with your Supreme Court celebration events. Um, I'm not sure if any of my colleagues are able to make it to tonight's presentation, but let me call them out by name um, to give all of them the, the, um, the recognition they deserve. Justice Brent Apple, Justice Tom Waterman, Justice Ed Mansfield, Justice Christopher McDonald, Justice Dana Oxley, and Justice Matt McDermott. Um, at this time, on behalf of the entire court, I would like to recognize the Drake Law students who participated in the final round of the Supreme Court competition before our court last week. We heard these oral arguments by the students based on a problem that you can find online. The students who argued the court are very talented advocates. Their names are as follows. Logan Brundage, Josh Hughes, Janice Lane, and Corey Mullins. Each of these students received the Davis, Brown, Kane, Shores, and Roberts Award of Excellence. This award recognizes their accomplishments in reaching the finals of this competition and the high level of skill demonstrated during arguments. It is my honor to tell you just a little bit more about this award. Mr. Hudson was a 1916 graduate of Drake Law School, and this award is made possible by his daughter, Peggy Rastetter, as well as his grandson, Richard Rastetter Jr., who is a 1972 graduate of the law school. Each year, the finalists present their arguments to the court, and the justice, justices select one individual who exemplifies the skills, dedication, and character demanded of the, of the complete advocate. The award for outstanding student practitioner in the art of appellate advocacy goes to the student who in the opinion of the justices of the Iowa Supreme Court makes the best argument before them during the Supreme Court competition. This year, we are proud to award the Rodney L. Hudson Appellate Advocacy Award to Logan Brundage. Congratulations, Logan. Thank you, Chief Justice Christensen, and congratulations, Logan. 
I'm Associate Dean Andrew Jers, and on behalf of the entire law school and university community, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to the Iowa Supreme Court and to all of those in the judicial branch and bar who, for eight decades, have helped to sustain the marvelous tradition of the Supreme Court celebration. It is a point of immeasurable pride at our law school that we enjoy such a strong and historic relationship with our Supreme Court. We appreciate your continuing interest in and support of our students and their education. I now have the honor of announcing the Stevens Faculty Scholar of the Year Award, chosen by an anonymous donor as the faculty member who has made the most significant contribution to scholarship during the previous year. Scholarly research helps professors thoroughly master their subjects and makes them better teachers. And of course, it also increases the prestige and academic reputation of Drake Law nationwide. We had another incredible year for faculty scholarship, and so it was very difficult to determine a winner. This year's winner was extremely productive, which is typical for her, publishing multiple law review articles, a book chapter, and finalizing a textbook on legal writing. Clearly, this is just an impressive, very impressive quality of writing, but the quality and breadth of the writing made it stand out and ensures the lasting impact of her work. These articles and books ask the Academy important questions about the instructional methods we use in class, barriers to greater inclusiveness in our programs, and how to overcome them. She is also part of a legal writing faculty, recognized just this month as one of the top 10 programs in that area in the entire United States. The Stevens Faculty Scholar of the Year is Professor Melissa Warish. Congratulations, Melissa. Good evening. My name is Claire Davison. I'm the outgoing Student Bar Association president, and in a few weeks, I will be a proud alumna of Drake University Law School. On behalf of all students, welcome and thank you for joining us. Today, I'm honored to present the Leland Forrest Outstanding Professor Award. The Professor of the Year Award recognizes one of the faculty for their contributions to the quality of legal education, both in and out of the classroom. The recipient is chosen by the third year students, and this professor will lead the class into the long awaited in-person graduation this May. To say that teaching or attending law school this year of all years was a challenge would be an understatement. For this 3L class, we got the best of both worlds of this pandemic. We started our law school careers in person. We got through our 1L year just as any other member of the bar did. But by spring of our 2L year, our legal education had taken a form none of us had ever expected. This professor has been through it all with us, from taking us through the rules of civil procedure our 1L year, to guiding us through what must have felt like almost every Supreme Court case ever decided in constitutional law, to acting out evidence cases with bobbleheads on our computer screens, this professor has been completely committed to the extremely high quality of education from the first day we set foot on campus. He makes difficult and dense material easy to understand and is always finding new ways to engage students in the classroom. Not only that, but as students pointed out in their testimonials of this professor, his kindness and willingness to help any student in any way he can, in or out of the classroom, has remained a constant throughout our tumultuous law school careers. He treats every person he meets with the utmost respect and actively works to listen and understand the unique perspectives they bring to the table. For these reasons, I'm honored to present the Leland Forrest Outstanding Professor of the Year Award to Anthony Goggin. Congratulations, Melissa and Tony. So it's now my privilege to introduce our guest speaker, Jim Overdorf, who's the Senior Vice President of Football Administration for the Buffalo Bills. I always tell prospective students that you can do anything with a law degree, 
And Jim is a great example of that, although I'm not sure I can guarantee students that they can do what he's done. After graduating from Drake Law in 1986, Jim joined the Buffalo Bills organization as a training camp intern and worked in public relations, player personnel, and the ticket office while gaining admission to the New York State Bar. He worked his way up the ladder of, that, of the organization, eventually being promoted to Vice President of Business Administration and then Vice President of Football Administration. In 2008, Jim was named a Senior Vice President of the Bills organization, which makes him responsible for all administrative aspects of the football side of the organization. That means he's the club's lead negotiator of player contracts and oversees the salary cap and player payroll. He oversees general office and legal operations and is the club's liaison to the league's legal arm, the NFL Management Council. Jim earned his bachelor's degree in political science from Eckerd College, where he was a member of the school's rugby team. He and his wife, Michelle, have a daughter, Katie, a son-in-law, Rob, and two grandchildren, J.R. and Lucy. On a personal note, I do appreciate that Jim agreed to speak to us tonight, despite the fact that I admitted to him that I'm a lifelong Chiefs fan. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Dean Anderson. Ladies and gentlemen, alumni, colleagues, friends, and Chief Justice Christensen, I think it is only proper to open my presentation by saying something I've waited over 30 years to say. May it please the court. It is an honor to be asked to speak at this prestigious event, and I would like to thank Drake Law School and specifically Dean Jerry Anderson for the opportunity to address you this evening. I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate Joe Crookham, Jeff Goodman, Adam Gregg, and Janet Phipps Burkhead as the 2021 Alumni Award honorees. When Dean Anderson first reached out to me and asked me to speak at this event, I had mixed emotions. He suggested topics such as the life of a lawyer in the NFL. While I was honored to be asked, I felt I needed to let Dean Anderson know that much of my work during the 30 plus years with the Bills was not as a lawyer or, or the general counsel of the club. However, using the phrase that is very familiar to football fans, Upon further review, I have come up with another acronym for NFL, which is Never Forget Lawyers, and how it relates to my experiences in the National Football League. Hopefully by the time I am finished this evening, all of you will see why the NFL will never forget lawyers. My first position with the Buffalo Bills was as a training camp intern. In that position, I was involved with the setup and operations of training camp. It did not take long for me to realize that even in sports, you can never forget lawyers because the antitrust litigation with the soon to be defunct USFL had come to a head that summer. The NFL lost that lawsuit with the jury awarding $1 in damages to the USFL, which was trebled and with interest, the total award was $3.76. Even though the NFL lost, I will never forget lawyers because the league lawyers set forth a convincing argument that the USFL had done itself more damage financially than the monopoly the jury ruled the NFL was guilty of. More importantly, from the perspective of the Buffalo Bills, the demise of the USFL led to the signing of future Hall of Fame quarterback Jim Kelly, who would change the fortunes of the organization for the next decade. At the conclusion of training camp, I was asked to stay on as an intern in the public relations department. That was followed by a stint in the scouting department, helping with the preparation of the upcoming NFL draft. Shortly after the draft, I was assigned to the ticket office where I again realized the NFL never forgets lawyers. While not involved in the legalities of the situation, I experienced my first labor dispute. The NFL players went out on strike after the regular season started because ownership and the players union were unable to come to terms on a collective bargaining agreement. This was an emotional time as teams were tasked with finding replacement players and some NFL players crossed the picket lines with their teammates that their teammates had formed outside the entrances of stadiums throughout the league. After striking for 24 days and losing support within the ranks of the players, the strike ended and the players returned to play a shortened season. In 1993, after the league had experimented for a couple of years with a free agency system referred to as Plan B, which was ultimately ruled to be in violation of anti antitrust laws, the league entered into a collective bargaining agreement with the players union. It was around this time that the general manager, now Hall of Famer, Bill Polian, pulled me aside and said he felt this would be an area that I could really utilize my skills. 
The new CBA was going to allow player movement via free agency and provided for a league-wide salary cap. The CBA, as he put it, would require someone with the skills to understand what was written in that agreement. His words were along the lines of, you know, someone like you with a legal background. Thus, the NFL began to solidify my position that it will never forget lawyers. After the 1993 collective bargaining agreement, the league had a period of labor peace until 2011. In March of 2011, the league had another work stoppage, only this time the players were locked out by the, club, by the clubs. The lockout lasted from March through the end of July. While this work stoppage ended with a new collective bargaining agreement, the lockout proved to be more, much more burdensome than the clubs will not, and the clubs will never forget lawyers because the lawyers supplied the guidelines and direction as to what clubs had to do to be properly prepared to conduct the lockout. After spending a year in the ticket office, I was promoted to a position in which I reported directly to the assistant general manager. It was at that time that I got my first exposure to the world of workers' compensation and continue to this day to be actively involved with it. The club has always utilized an outside counsel for this area, but I am the liaison for the club, and this is definitely an area you never forget lawyers. This aspect of the job entails making sure injuries are reported on a timely basis to counsel and providing them with the information to adequately represent the club in court. Counsel needs to know the player's salary, how many games they missed, how and where they were injured, and whether there was a type of injury any type of injury settlement. Decisions need to be made as to whether an independent medical examination is needed to apportion an injury to a certain accident and or accidents as players frequently have multiple injuries to the same body parts. And that's the easy part. The most difficult part of workers' compensation from our club's perspective are the cumulative trauma claims received from California. Again, never forget lawyers because we have counsel in California that we rely very heavily on to help us wade through the nuances of these California claims. It is not uncommon for us to have claims filed and to still be paying claims by players that played in the league over 30 years ago. Without California counsel, this would be an administrative nightmare. During that time in my career, I was also given many duties that required very good organizational skills, which I attribute to my learning experience here at Drake. I was selected by our general manager to organize the team's trips to four consecutive Super Bowls. Additionally, I was asked to do the same for international games the team played in London and Berlin. The tasks involved in organizing these trips included working with the airlines, hotels, and practice facilities to ensure that the team travel went as smoothly as possible. Many of these trips also required the additional planning for all the player and staff families. After organizing these trips, I was then asked to oversee our team travel to all the team's away games, which included the negotiation of hotel, airline, bus, and moving companies, which I did for the next 20 years in addition to my other duties. The 1993 CBA, which I previously mentioned, really brought to the forefront the NFL Management Council with its legal arm, which is the legal arm of the league. Within weeks of the announcement of that collective bargaining agreement, all 28 teams, the league has now since expanded to 32 teams, were required to attend the league's first labor seminar, which was conducted by the Management Council and its team of lawyers. I'll never forget that meeting because it was the first meeting I ever attended in which all the teams were represented by their owners and top level executives. There were only three representatives allowed per club and I was one of the three representing the bills. To this day, I am sure I was the lowest paid person in that room. But there was something else that was special about that meeting for me. That the meeting had already started with teams sitting on both sides of three long rows of tables. While the bills have always been my favorite team, my other favorite team growing up was the Oakland, now Las Vegas Raiders. At this meeting, two of the Raider representatives were sitting right across from me with an empty chair in between them. Then, like an old Western movie, the room came to, the, the room came to a hush and the heads turned as the professional football icon, L. Davis, the owner of the Raiders, entered the room dressed in a white sweatsuit and white sneakers as he made his way to that empty chair right across from me. I'm not sure I really knew what, I'm not really sure that I knew what was said for the next couple of minutes of the presentation 
as I sat there awestruck as to what had just transpired. One of the most powerful men ever in the history of professional football was sitting in the chair directly across from me. Now, since that first meeting, I have attended the annual labor seminar every year. And during that seminar, we are once again reminded as to why the NFL never forgets lawyers, as we are briefed on labor issues that have occurred during the past year. From that day forward, I have been the Buffalo Bills liaison with management council and deal with them frequently on player grievances, player contracts, and salary cap issues. Player grievances can be classified as injury or non-injury grievances. The injury grievance is when a player feels he has been released by a club while still suffering from an injury which inhibits his ability to play the game. A non-injury grievance could stem from a player disagreeing to the amount of a fine the club imposed on him or from a claim that he feels he is entitled to as a particular benefit under the CBA. These, these grievances are heard by an arbitrator and the club is represented by an attorney from the management council. I work in conjunction with the management council formulating the strategy as to the defense of any grievance. I've also spent over 20 years negotiating player contracts and working with the management council to make sure those contracts are CBA compliant as management council will disapprove a contract if it is not compliant. In some of the more involved contracts, I never forget lawyers as I will ask the management council to review the contract before submitting it to the player's agent for his review. The difficult thing about that is it takes time for the, that review and as the negotiator, you start to get pressure from your organization because they want to announce the signing, especially if it's a prominent player versus my position that there should be no announcement until the player is officially signed. I have taken that position because one of my first contract negotiations went something like this. The player's agent and I agreed to all the terms of a contract on a Friday. Normally, we would have the player fly in to sign the contract the next day, as it was the off season. The agent requested the player come in Monday as the player had a wedding to attend on Saturday. I agreed that Monday would work. I informed the GM that the player would be in the office on Monday to sign his contract. Saturday morning, the GM called me and informed me that the player had signed with another team. Needless to say, the GM was not very happy and the agent took no accountability. So that has forever been ingrained in my head. Remembering that hard lesson, Years later, I was negotiating the club's first ever $100 million contract for a very high profile player. I was getting pressure from all sides to make the announcement of an agreement prior to the player signing as I had sent the contract to the management council for their review. I stuck to my guns and although the press conference was delayed multiple times, I waited and will never forget lawyers when we are talking contracts that involve millions of dollars. Did I say millions of dollars? And did, I, and did I say a $100 million contract for a player? I guess you could say we've come a long way from a salary cap in 1994 of $34.6 million to the present amount of $182.5 million, which is down from $198.5 million due to COVID in, in 2020. Since its inception, I have managed the salary cap for the Buffalo Bills. And again, that requires me to utilize the many different skills I learned at Drake. Knowing how to structure the contracts and understanding the consequences of those contracts that are heavy with incentives is tantamount in my job. Projecting two and three years into the future is a must as the team will have young players that are going to be eligible for big paydays upon expiration of their rookie contracts. Unexpected events like COVID aren't things you plan for, but you must be able to adapt and offer solutions because the NFL is competitive and every team is always looking for the slightest advantage. I've been very fortunate to have a career in profession where NFL hasn't meant National Football League or never forget lawyers, but has actually meant not for long. I credit much of my success and longevity to the foundation that was laid here at Drake in teaching me how to analyze and organize my thoughts and produce convincing arguments. In addition to achieve success, I realize there are those that have made me who I am today. My wife, Michelle, has been my biggest supporter since the day we met at the Bills. I would turn my daughter Katie and her husband Rob with our two beautiful grandchildren, my biggest fans. And last but not least, I thank my parents for not only providing the financial wherewithal to attend Drake, but they taught me that you can't go wrong if you abide by the core principles of hard work and honesty. Thank you to, thank you to Dean Anderson and the Drake community for allowing me this opportunity to speak to all of you tonight 
And remember, never forget lawyers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. It's it's great to know that you're using your law training in so many different ways in a non-traditional but, but fascinating career. We appreciate you being with us this evening. Before we present our final awards, I just want to say a few words to our alumni and friends about how things are going here at Drake Law. It's obviously been a very challenging year, but by now you're probably getting a little weary of stories of how various institutions have carried on during the pandemic. But just let me say how much I appreciate the flexibility, perseverance, and dedication of our faculty and staff who quickly adapted to a whole new world of remote education. I also deeply appreciate our students who, re who displayed remarkable resilience and self-reliance in continuing their education in the face of these challenges. Don't ever let it be said that this generation doesn't have grit because I can tell you that they do. But we could not have made it through this year without the support of our alumni and friends. Whether it was adjunct professors learning to teach quickly online or alumni stepping up to increase our student financial aid budget or moot court co coaches continuing to provide that crucial co-curricular education in a whole new way. I really can't thank you enough. Drake has a set of core values and one of them is we're all in this together. And that has never been more true than this year. Despite the challenges, we have some wonderful things to celebrate this year. As Dean Jurors mentioned, our legal writing program was ranked ninth in the country by US News this month. We all know how important legal writing is to successful lawyers. And so this is a really great recognition. It's a testament to our amazing faculty, Professors Melissa Warish and Danielle Shelton, who have pioneered innovative teaching techniques that have been a model for programs across the country. And I also want to give kudos to our wonderful legal writing adjunct professors, Christy Latta and Connor Wasson of the Allers Firm, who have spent many, many hours teaching this crucial skill to our 1L students. We continue to move up the overall rankings also, and this year achieved our highest U.S. News ranking ever. This spring, we launched our Wrongful Convictions Clinical Program, which is a unique partnership with the State Public Defender's Office. As in all of our clinics, students are performing important public service while getting invaluable experience, the kind you just can't get sitting in a classroom. We also started a new Spring Start Program with our first class of students starting their legal studies last January. We're trying to provide the kind of flexibility that students today are looking for and we think it's working very well. So please help us spread the word to those students who may not want to wait until next fall to begin law school. We had a successful reaccreditation visit from the ABA. They come every 10 years, so it's, it's a really big deal. They examine every nook and cranny of the school's operations to ensure compliance with the ABA standards. And we've been re working really hard for the last year uh, to prepare for this with a team led by Dean Jurors. I'm happy to say the visit went very well, and I have to say that that's because in addition to outstanding faculty, we're blessed with a great staff who put together the reports and documents and arranged the visit with such skill that the ABA came away duly impressed with our whole operation. In particular, I wanna thank Susan, Sarah Hughes, the assistant to the Dean, for spearheading all of the logistics that went into that visit. We celebrated a new event this year, which is especially relevant to this Supreme Court celebration. And that was our inaugural Mark S. Cady Day of Public Service. As most of you know, our alum, Mark Cady, was the Chief Justice of the Iowa Supreme Court when he tragically passed away in November 2019. His career was dedicated to public service and he cared deeply about access to justice for all citizens. So with the help of many partners, including the Iowa State Bar Association and Iowa Legal Aid, we launched the Katie Day of Public Service to honor Justice Katie and highlight how much good lawyers do for society. It was really a tremendous success. I was gratified that so many lawyers stepped up to do public service projects ranging from providing pro bono services to community service. I wanna thank our alumni and special events director, Terry Howard for her work to make this project a resounding success. Please save the date for next year's Katie Day of Public Service, which will be October 22nd, uh, 2021. And we'd love to see the event continue to grow and we'd love to have you be a part of it. 
Finally, I'm sad to report that we have three outstanding faculty retiring at the end of this year, Andrea Charlo, David McCord, and Morris Strasberg. Between them, they have over a century of service to Drake Law School, and they represent the very best in terms of their teaching scholarship and service. I know many alumni out there remember these professors and will know that they put their students first throughout their careers, exhibiting the kind of student-centered approach to education that makes Drake a wonderful place. We plan to have a last lecture CLE and recognition uh, reception honoring them next fall. So look for that. And to provide a lasting honor of, for Andrea, David, and Maura, we have also established a scholarship fund. Our alum, Johnny Taylor, jump-started that effort with two very generous contributions. So future generations of students will continue to benefit from their legacy. If you're interested in contributing, you can just mark your contribution in honor of these professors and we'll add it to that scholarship fund. I also want to note another sad milestone, the passing of Professor Emeritus, Marty Begleiter. Marty was a nationally recognized expert in trust and estate law and taught at Drake for 37 years before retiring in 2016. I know that many alumni will remember his dedication and the faculty and staff have lost a very special colleague and friend. I'm pleased to announce that the Iowa Academy of Trust and Estate Council has established a student award in his honor, and we were able to select the first recipient of the Beglider Award last week. While we're on the subject of faculty, I want to turn to a happier occasion, which is the presentation of a couple of faculty and alumni portraits. From time to time, we recognize the accomplishment of alumni or long-serving members of our faculty by unveiling a portrait which will hang in our law school gallery. Tonight, we have the opportunity to honor three very distinguished individuals whose contribu contributions to the law school and the legal profession are profound. First, it gives me great pleasure to present the portrait of Judge Joseph C. Howard, Sr. Judge Howard was truly a force for change his entire career. Joseph was the son of Charles Howard, who was also a Drake Law grad and one of the founders of the National Bar Association, whose archives we have here at Drake. Joseph received his Bachelor of Laws degree from Drake in 1955 and his JD in 1966, in the meantime, becoming the first black member of the Phi Alpha, Data, Phi Alpha Delta Law Fraternity. After he graduated from Drake Law, he went to Baltimore and became the first African-American chief of the trial section of the state attorney's office, which is impressive enough, but what's even more impressive is what he did with that position. He started out by pointing, in, pointing out inequality in the criminal justice system. For example, he produced a report showing incredible disparities in punishment. For example, that 30 black men had been executed in Baltimore for raping white women, but no one had ever been executed for raping a black woman. He later pointed out the disparities on the bench, that almost all the judges were white in a city that was majority African-American. To cap his career, he became the first African-American judge on the Federal District Court in Baltimore. He passed away in 2000. We're very proud of Judge Howard and happy that he will henceforth join our group of current federal judges hanging in the hallway at Cartwright, Cartwright Hall. And I wanna especially thank Judge Mark, Mark Bennett, who is one of those federal judges and also a member of our faculty for suggesting that we add Judge Howard to that group. Clearly, this is an honor that is long overdue. Second, we want to recognize Professor Maura Strasberg, who is retiring, as I mentioned, at the end of this year. Professor Strasberg received her bachelor's degree from Swarthmore and her master's in philosophy from Boston University and her JD from Columbia Law School, where she was on the Law Review. After clerking for the First Circuit Court of Appeals, she practiced in Boston before coming to Drake in 1991, which actually is the same year I did. So we have uh, a special bond for being first year professors together. She's a nationally recognized scholar, especially in the area of polygamy, and recently won our Stevens Faculty Scholar Award. I think the most impressive thing about Mora is her commitment to students. She spends an amazing amount of time 
in individual student conferences in which she works with students to improve their legal reasoning skills. It's an incredible commitment, which she does year after year. She's also undertaken some of our most important service work, including this year serving on our accreditation committee, for example. She's a wonderful colleague, and we're very proud to hang this portrait of Mora this year. Finally, we honor Professor Hunter Clark, known to his friends as Rod. Professor Clark has one of the most impressive resumes, resumes you'll ever see. He graduated cum laude from Harvard College and then went on to graduate from Harvard Law School for his JD. He, earned, he served in a wide variety of professional positions from the Wall Street firm of Fried Frank to, the chief to being the chief counsel of the District of Columbia to writing articles for Time Magazine. That writing ability, particularly the ability to tell a story that will instruct while it also captivates you, resulted in the publication of two successful biographies of Supreme Court justices, Thurgood Marshall and William Brennan. His more recent work focuses on international law and human rights. Rod came to Drake in 1993, and since I had the office next to him for many years, I can attest to the many hours he's spent with students on seminar papers, helping them turn their ideas into well-structured, precisely written research. I know there are hundreds of Drake Law grads out there who are better writers, better critical thinkers, and hopefully better lawyers and citizens of the world because they've had a class with Professor Clark. We're very proud to present this portrait of Professor Rod Clark. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the portrait artist, Mary Muller, who painted Mora and Rod's portraits and so many of our other portraits hanging in our gallery. Thank you, Mary, for sharing your incredible talent with Drake Law School. It's now my pleasure to announce this year's alumni awards, which are selected by our Board of Counselors. There are always so many outstanding nominees in it, and it makes me proud to even consider the candidates that we have. There are so many Drake Law graduates doing wonderful things in the world. Our first award is the Distinguished Public Service Award, which recognizes Drake Law alumni who have demonstrated an outstanding commitment to public service over the course of their careers. The board selected Brigadier General Janet Phipps Burkhead as this year's honoree. There are three main reasons the board selected Janet this year. First, her legal career has been largely devoted to public service, including as director of the Iowa Department of General Services and the Iowa Department of Administrative Services, as well as serving as the Michigan Department of Management and Budget Director. In addition, in addition to her service to state government, Janet spent 28 years in the military with the Army Reserves, the Michigan National Guard, and the Iowa National Guard. She was commissioned as an officer in 1985 and retired in 2013 as Brigadier General, Deputy Commanding General with the Iowa National Guard. Finally, her record of community service is outstanding. She served on numerous boards of directors, including the Rotary Club of Des Moines, the Rotary, Rotary Club of Des Moines Foundation Board, On With Life, Girl Scouts of Greater Iowa, and the University of Iowa's College of Education Advisory Board, among many others. She also served on Drake Law School's Board of Counselors for many years, including recently serving as our president. We're not the only ones to recognize her contributions and excellence. She received the 2014 Women of Impact Award from the Drake University College of Business and Public Administration and was a 2012 Des Moines Business Record Woman of Influence. Congratulations, Janet, for this well-deserved recognition and thank you for all you do and have done for us all. Here's a, a video Good from evening. Janet. It is my honor to receive the 2020 Distinguished Public Service Award from Drake Law School. I have had a gratifying and fulfilling career, serving 28 years in the military, as well as in the public sector of Iowa and Michigan state governments. I felt my experiences in each of these areas complemented each other greatly. Using my training and experience from my military career in my state government positions and vice versa. Again, thank you for this recognition. I am truly humbled.
I would also like to congratulate the other alumni awardees and thank you for all you have done. Congratulations, Janet. Next, Maggie White, president of our newly established Recent Alumni Engagement Board, will recognize the winner of the Recent Alumni of the Year Award. Good evening. The next award recognizes an individual who has graduated in the past 15 years as Recent Alumnus of the Year. Recipients have both a high level of professional success early in their careers and have made an impact on the community through public service. From a really accomplished group of nominees, the board selected Lieutenant Governor Adam Gregg as this year's honoree. Lieutenant Governor Adam Gregg serves as Iowa's 47th Lieutenant Governor. He chairs the Governor's Feeding Iowans Task Force and Focus Committee on Criminal Justice Reform and is co-chair of the Governor's Empower Rural Iowa Initiative. At the national level, Lieutenant Governor Gregg serves on the executive committee of the National Lieutenant Governors Association and is the former chair of the Republican Lieutenant Governors Association. He has also served as a Hunt Keen Leadership Fellow focused on leadership and education policy and was chosen for the Aspen Institute Riddell Fellowship. Lieutenant Governor Gregg previously served as the state public defender, a position he was appointed to in 2014. In that role, he led a 220 employee organization focused on providing the constitutional right to counsel for Iowans. He modernized the agency by moving processes online, improving efficiency while increasing the ability to detect fraudulent claims for taxpayer dollars. He also created a new division to investigate potential wrongful convictions in the criminal justice system. From 2013 to 2014, Lieutenant Governor Gregg served in the governor's office as legislative liaison and policy advisor. Prior to that, he practiced at the Brown Winnick Law Firm in Des Moines. After graduating first in his class from Central College while playing football for the Dutch, Lieutenant Governor Gregg earned his Juris Doctor from Drake in 2009 with high honors, where he was an Opperman Scholar, Iowa Supreme Court Scholar, and staff member for the Drake Law Review. The faculty selected him for the Hoy Award, given to the individual who demonstrates the greatest promise as an advocate, public service, and practitioner, which turned out to be a very perceptive choice. And now we will hear a brief message from Lieutenant Governor Gregg. Hey everyone, Lieutenant Governor Adam Gregg here coming to you from the Iowa Capitol. I simply wanna say thank you. What an honor it is to receive this award. And I feel so fortunate to be a Drake Law grad. While my time at Drake Law was certainly academically rigorous, I also had some great times as well. I made lifelong friends, whether that was competing against the undergrads in intramural flag football, maybe even uh, decompressing after a stressful exam at the occasional bar review. I also had the opportunity to learn from world-class professors, all while going to school in the state that I love and which I'm now very proud to serve. I've used my Drake Law degree at every step of my career, even though I've taken a non-traditional path. From my time at the Brown Winnick Law Firm in Des Moines to my time serving as legislative liaison for Governor Branstad, and especially in my role as state public defender, ensuring that every Iowan received the constitutional right to counsel. I'm especially pleased that the Wrongful Conviction Division, which I started when I was state public defender, has now blossomed into a clinical relationship with Drake, giving current law students an incredible learning opportunity. And I use my degree every day as Lieutenant Governor as we consider state policy and as I've had the opportunity to lead task forces on important issues like criminal justice reform. Drake instilled in me a sense of duty and a passion for public service. At Drake, I learned that a legal education can be one of the most effective tools to serve others, and Drake Law positioned me to make the most of it. To the students currently at Drake, take advantage of this extraordinary opportunity in your life to learn at Drake Law. To the faculty and staff at Drake, Thank you for your wonderful instruction that has set me up and so many others for success. And to those who nominated me, thank you for this incredible honor. Thank you, Maggie, and congratulations, Lieutenant Governor. Now it gives me great pride to introduce our Alumni of the Year Award winners. Each year at this celebration, we recognize a graduate whose professional career 
and dedication to the law school exemplifies the qualities that we strive to instill in our graduates. This year, the board selected two awardees, Joe Crookham and Jeff Goodman. Joe P. Crookham is the chairman of the board and principal owner of Musco Lighting. For the past 50 years, he has served as chief executive officer, building Musco in partnership with Myron Gordon to a global corporation with 35 offices worldwide, doing, businesses in a, doing business in 114 countries with a team of over 1,300 people. Musco pioneered the use of LED lighting on large scale structures and over the years has been involved in lighting major sports facilities across the country. If you've ever been to a football game or a baseball game from Little League on up, you will have seen and benefited from Musco lighting. Joe has participated and supported lighting for the Olympic Games and national sites, including Mount Rushmore, the Washington Monument, the White House, and the Statue of Liberty. Joe gets the most pride and satisfaction from the thousands of community and neighborhood facilities he is involved in to help kids and families stay safe and active. He's active in local and state level development projects, especially those that create educational and recreational opportunities. Nationally, he's working with the Black Players for Change and the Black Women's Player Collective to expand the U.S. Soccer Foundation's efforts to provide children in underserved neighborhoods access and equal opportunity to play soccer. Joe has served in leadership positions for numerous charitable organizations, including the National Parks Foundation, Little League Baseball Foundation, and the William Penn University Board of Trustees, among many others. He engaged in the practice of law for 12 years before shifting focus to Musco full-time. He received his Juris Doctor degree from Drake Law School in 1968 and his bachelor's degree and master's of business administration from the University of Iowa. In 2017, Joe and his wife Jeannie established the Crookham Scholars Program at Drake Law. The Crookham Scholarships through the Crookham Family Foundation help students from underrepresented groups attend Drake Law School, helping diversify both the law school and the legal profession, particularly in Iowa. The law school and the board, on behalf of all of our alumni, deeply appreciate their support. Now, here's a message from Joe. First of all, I want to thank Drake University for this recognition and honor. Perhaps even more importantly, I want to thank Drake for the great experience and education I received in their law school. The experience was both challenging and a great opportunity to develop a lifetime of friendships and skills. I recall professors that at times challenged me and my classmates to do things that seemed excessive. But after we'd worked our way through it, we appreciated the many things we gained from the effort. The professors and the school were simultaneously warm and welcoming and demanding of intensive effort to understand and learn the skills needed for success in the legal profession, specifically, and life generally. Many of the opportunities and satisfactions which I have obtained in life can be attributed to those experiences and that training. Thank you, Drake University. Thank you, Joe. Our co-recipient of the Alumni of the Year Award is Jeff Goodman from the class of 1985. Jeff is a trial lawyer with the firm of Goodman Keller here in Des Moines and has built an excellent reputation as a litigator over the last 35 years. He's also a founder and president of Harbinger Jury Consultants, Inc., which offers focus groups, mock trials, mediation on steroids, jury selection services, and post-trial juror interviews to lawyers and clients throughout the United States. Jeff is an active member of numerous law groups, such as the Inns of Court and the American and Iowa Associations for Justice, and his excellence in advocacy has been recognized by membership in the American Board of Trial Advocates. He also has dedicated significant amounts of time to the judicial branch, serving on the State Court Judicial Nominating Commission, the 5C District Court Judicial Nominating Commission, and the Federal Judicial Nominating Commission. His professional success and motivation is one reason we're very proud of Jeff. But another very important factor 
is his amazing support for his alma mater. Jeff is the epitome of a dedicated alum who will always respond to a re request to help out in a great variety of ways. He and his wife, Liz, who is also a Drake Law grad, has sponsored the prestigious Goodman Award for many years, providing many thousands of dollars of welcome financial support to many deserving Drake Law students. In addition, Jeff has been a longtime active, engaged member of our Board of Counselors, where his energy and ideas have inspired us. Two years ago, Jeff engaged in a remarkable effort to increase Drake's connection to his class, the class of 1985. He called every single one of his classmates and got them to join a face group, Facebook group page, and then continued to build the connection by asking them about their Drake Law experiences. In addition to re-engaging that class with Drake, Jeff asked them to pay it forward, and the result was a substantial fund that not only helped us renovate a conference room in, Dr in Cartwright Hall, but also fund a class of 1985 scholarship to benefit our students. So thanks to the class of 1985, and especially thank you to Jeff. You inspire us all by your passion and vision. And now a few words from Jeff. Thank you, Dean Anderson. I'm humbled and honored to receive this recognition. The Drake Alumni of the Year Award means a great deal to me. This award also means a great deal to the members of the Drake Law School Class of 1985 who are entitled to a big share of the credit for their generous gifts that built and furnished the East Bay Conference Room and also funded a Pay It Forward program for the Drake Law students in financial need. The Pay It Forward program was the brainchild of my fellow classmates John Palter and Jim Grau. I also want to especially thank fellow classmates Rose Vasquez, Anthony Contry, and Joe McLaughlin for their leadership and supporting gifts, along with 22 other classmates who generously gave gifts of $1,000 to our alma mater and those who gave other amounts that made all of this possible. My Drake Law degree means a great deal to me. In fact, it changed my life. It's at Drake Law School where I met my wife, Liz, who has been my life partner and the love of my life. The Drake Law School allowed me to transform my bachelor's degree into, uh, in English and philosophy into a professional skill which allowed me to lead an enjoyable and successful life as a trial lawyer. I encourage each of my fellow alumni to wonder, who would you be without your Drake Law degree? For me, my Drake Law degree changed my life, and tonight I express my gratitude to the Drake Law School by saying thank you. It's a great pleasure to serve my alma mater, and I look forward to doing so for many years to come. Thank you very much, Jeff, and thanks for all you do for Drake. Congratulations to all of our alumni award winners. Before we conclude, I want to thank the firm at My Master Good for sponsoring several of the student events that have been held during this Supreme Court Celebration Week. Students in the organizations like uh, the Law Review, the Journal of Ag Law, and the Moot Court teams work hard all year, and the My Master Gift allowed us to celebrate by providing them some refreshments to enjoy at those celebrations. I also want to thank the always awesome Terry Howard for doing all the organizational work to make this event and all the events that we've held this week a success. Please stay in touch on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, it really does help us for you to become a social ambassador for Drake Law to help us get the word out about all the good things that are happening here. Uh, this is, concludes our evening's festivities, and I want to thank you all for joining us, and I hope to see you at future events, hopefully in person very soon. Don't forget that this Saturday, we're going to have our Constitutional Law Symposium, which is always an amazing event. It's going to be happening virtually, and there's still time for you to sign up under our alumni events uh, page on our webpage. Good night and best wishes. Thank you.